And so for those of you who don't know me, I've been with the department since April 2017. Uh, in addition to my duties providing direct neighbor council support, I'm also the department's re representative to the budget advocates, uh, budget tribunes. I'm the chief resilience officer, as well as the uh, liaison to the aging liaisons. Um, and I'm here to talk about the role of neighborhood council alliances and liaisons, uh, which is one of the things that I work with a lot at the department. Um, so alliances. First of all, I'll briefly describe alliances. Uh, I won't go into much detail about each one, just to say that um, there are issue-based alliances and then there are geographic alliances. One of the goals and objectives of the neighborhood council system as written in the plan for a citywide system of neighborhood councils says that neighborhood councils may join together in regional and citywide alliances as a means to engage in communication, interaction, and collaboration. For example, one of the issue-based alliances that I cover is the neighborhood council emergency preparedness alliance. Uh, one of the geographic based alliances, for example, because uh, there are many, is the South Los Angeles Alliance of Neighborhood Councils. Um, and uh, according to my records here, uh, if you include Congress, which technically isn't, maybe isn't, some don't consider an alliance, but um, there's about 17. Uh, and so um, many people who are, who are here as panelists attend many of those, like Jack Humperville with the DWP oversight the DOP advocacy. We have representatives uh, from the West Side Regional Alliance of Councils, which represents uh, 13 groups, including two non-neighborhood council areas, which in the Palisades and Brentwood, we do not have neighborhood councils, but we, what we, but they're included as well, because we believe in inclusivity. Um, and so uh, I won't read the list because it's very long, but uh, it is on our website if you'd like to read it. Um, and uh, um, and that's empowerla.org. Please, please keep in mind that the alliances do not have to comply with the Brown Act during their meetings as they are not certified neighborhood councils. So just so everyone, those who aren't aware of that, I repeat, they are not certified neighborhood councils. However, as you know, they do serve a very valuable role in helping to engage people across their very large city. Um, so they do not, to, do not have to comply with the Brown Act. Uh, next, I would like to talk about the positions of neighborhood council liaisons. These positions are pure, purely issue-based. They're mostly created from city council motions, department directives, but mostly mayoral initiatives. For example, the homeless liaison was created in 2016 by the city council. The purposeful, purposeful aging liaison was created because of Mary, Mary Eric Garcetti's purposeful aging initiative. Um, so the, the liaison positions are as follows, aging, animal services, emergency preparedness, film, data, DWP, grievance, homelessness, public works, and resilience. And public safety. As you may have recognized here, there are some names of liaison positions that match up with the names of alliances, and there are some that do not. Also, there is no homeless alliance of any kind, for example, but the, homeless la the homelessness liaisons do meet regularly, and our department helps facilitate that. Um, so I've only mentioned that because sometimes I hear the terms get mixed up and that's really not a problem, but I just wanted to make sure to point out that you're clear on what they all, that all means. Um, so here's an example of how the liaison can be used as, a, as the focal point for this work. For example, every year the homeless count is held throughout, the, throughout Los Angeles County. The homeless liaison could be the person from the given NC that helps make sure the NC is involved or hosts an event to do this in that NC's area. I know, that I know several neighborhood councils across the city that have utilized their homeless liaison positions in this way. Great example. Another example of how you could use the liaison position is by having monthly town halls on the issue. For example, the NC could create a committee uh, on, an exact, on the exact issue. And instead of having me uh, meetings where it votes on things, it could instead just have one hour meetings once a month where a different pre presentation is done on the subject. For example, years ago, the Mar Vista Community Council did a fantastic job where for many years they had an aging committee. And every month, instead of have voting on different things, they just had a presentation. So one month, for example, they had the general manager from the Department of Aging, a representative from AP AARP the next month. The next month, they maybe had an expert caregiver to talk about what that means. Uh, and they got a very large uh, uh, turnout, probably more than most committees uh, I've seen. Uh, and that was a very good way to utilize that. Uh, and there's many other examples, and we have folks here that will speak about that later as well. Um, so as far as the duties go for the liaisons, 
um, I, you know, I kind of created a, a list here to kind of give you an idea just in general. Um, this sort of applies to any of the liaison positions and it's really up to each liaison to decide how much work they want to do. You could easily spend 40 hours a week and make this a full-time job because we have a huge city. Um, we're larger than a lot of states in the country. Uh, so there's a lot to do. Um, but I'll just read this list and uh, just so everyone has an idea of sort of uh, what they can do and you can pick and choose. So you can promote the city programs and services that relate to the liaison position you hold. For example, you know, you can tell your stakeholders about the emergency preparedness programs like CERT, it can help them and their neighbors. Uh, you can attend all alliance meetings that relate to your liaison position. You can collaborate with personnel at city departments or even maybe city commissions. Like we have Commissioner Lynn Schaefer here today. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here. Um, and, you know, involved with that position. For example, uh, the city has a Department of Aging. So maybe you want to contact that department uh, for the aging liaison uh, to, to advocate for uh, older adults in your area. Be acquainted with and work through the NC board members whose role it is to work on communications such as social media, your website, maybe if you have a newsletter, uh, to help get the word out about pending legislation in the city, the programs, the services, and so on. Uh, solicit input from stakeholders. Obviously, that's very important. Uh, ensure you're on the agenda at every board meeting so you can present what you're doing because there else nobody will know. <laughs> uh, do events, even if they're virtual, to get the word out uh, and maybe get to public participation. And there is a difference between outreach and public participation. You obviously want to try to get people to get involved. Um, partner with those who have the same liaison role in the neighboring NCs. So if you have a neighbor council maybe to the east of you, uh, and they have a, a, a lot of certain, you know, homeless liaisons, maybe, as well as you, uh, maybe you can do a lot regionally. Um, finally, encourage others to join. Uh, there's no limit with the amount of liaisons uh, you can have, uh, except for the uh, data liaison and the grievance liaisons, um, but I'll, I'll get into that soon. Um, uh, and uh, that's basically as far as that. Um, Conrad, since I ended early, do you want me to talk about the data and the grievance liaison to get that? No, open? I want to. I want to launch right into Jack Comfortville. So, okay. um, thank you so much for that introduction, John. By the way, I didn't int introduce myself. I'm Conrad Starr. I'm a member of the Congress of Neighborhoods Planning Committee, and I'm also on the Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council. So, let's turn it over to Jack Comfortville. He is a budget advocate, but he's also a budget rep, and he'll tell us all about that program in uh, 120 seconds. Jack, take it away. And you're muted. I guess I can't capture my time again. I can't start over. You're good. <laughs> no, my name is Jack Comfreyville, and I'm affiliated. I'm a stakeholder in the Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council, and I'm their budget representative. I'm also an elected budget advocate by the other 36, uh, uh, but uh, or I was elected by a budget advocate by the by the budget representatives in my region five. Essentially, the budget rep, rep advocates are an independent group uh, elected by uh, elected uh, by the other budget representatives, and our charge is basically. Question. Pardon. Uh, no. could, could John Darnell stop screen sharing? Okay, but that's it. If if we can oh, just, uh, well, just sh sh quit interrupting me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I don't get to, actually you saved me a lot of time. Uh, basically, we're charged with analyzing the city the city's budget. Uh, from an overview as well as from a departmental level. From the from the overview, we basically review all the documents that the city has. We have a number of conversations among ourselves and trying to develop a number of recommendations that are budget related. We also review, interview all, you know, we try to interview or talk with the general managers of all the various departments. Uh, some are more important than others. And at the same, and as a result of that, we try and make recommend, we, we do make recommendations with regards to ways they can improve their efficiency or their outreach. Um, they, our other charge is in addition to analyzing the budget and the departments is to make sure our neighborhood councils try and keep our neighborhood councils informed. We also like to think that we're a body of knowledge where people, if people have questions, they can ask their budget reps or their budget advocates or myself or any of the other uh, budget advocates who they, who they happen to know. In the past, we, in every year, we put out a white paper, which is usually anywhere from 75 to 100 pages, five, of pa five pages of which are our overview, uh, our budget recommendations, and the remainder are the neighbor, are the uh, departmental stuff. 
we've had some success in the past. Uh, I think a number of our recommendations have been adopted by the city. Uh, we also, a number of our recommendations have also stirred a lot of uh, conversation as uh, Paul Kerkorian, the head of the Budget and Finance Committee indicated to us this year. Uh, we meet every year with the Budget and Finance Committee, with the City Council, and also with the Mayor and the Mayor's Budget Team. So if we, so if anybody's interested, we'd love help, whether you're interested in the overall budget and or in a particular department. Uh, we have people that are interested in rec and parks. We have people that are interested in the overall budget, which I tend to specialize in. So if you have any questions, feel, feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jack. We'll now go to John Darnell, and he will talk for a moment about data liaison. John, you've got about 90 seconds. So yeah, uh, our department has a data program uh, and you can read it on, more about it on our website, but I'll briefly describe. So empowerla.org slash data, empowerla.org slash data. Uh, so our director of innovation, Julian Antolin, leads this effort. Since 2019, the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment has considered data as an, an, as an asset for community efforts and therefore develop useful resources and tools to help community leaders in their advocacy strategy and their decision-making processes. Um, you will find maps, applications, dashboards, and other links that will help you better understand the different facets of your community. The Data Li Literacy Program, in partnership with the Department of Neighbor Empowerment and the Mayor's Office, aims to develop new resources for your neighborhood council by providing training to members of your community on mapping and data-related tools. There are two different learning paths, the Data 101 and Data 201 training program. Uh, first, it's an introduction to, the, uh, to community data. And the second one is more about for the data liaison. Uh, the learning paths are designed according to the participants' computer skills and basic knowledge of data-related concepts. Uh, again, if you'd like to uh, see additional tools developed, don't hesitate to contact our department. Uh, and you can email us at data at empowerla.org. That's data at empowerla.org. And, and each, thank you, John Darnell. And you're you going to point him. up to three data liaisons. <laughs> OK, OK. Thank you. Yeah, they got the contact. And uh, by the way, we'll take questions at the end, hoping we have time. Tony Wilkinson, tell us about these two DWP groups in two minutes or less. The Los Angeles Department of Water and Power is the nation's largest municipal utility. It's also owned by us, the people of Los Angeles. And over a decade ago, DWP signed a historic memorandum of understanding with all the neighborhood councils. It's the only one in the city for information and transparency. And uh, our meetings are the first Saturday of every month at 8.30 a.m. You typically can find them listed uh, the, on the LANC website, actually, lancc.org each month. They're the best kept secret in the city. and. Uh, there are really two committees. There's the MOU committee that I, Tony Wilkinson, chair uh, on even numbered months. And then there's another committee uh, so that we can be unfettered and do action called the advocacy committee that Jack Humphreyville chairs on even number, I'm sorry, odd numbered months. Uh, and so that is the, uh, the structure we've got. The DWP's got a huge project to try and rebuild its entire power system. Uh, it's got another huge project to try and create another water source for Los Angeles out of recycled water from Hyperion. These are big multi-billion dollar issues that affect people's rates and our city. And so it's really important. DWP stuff should be a coffee table conversation, if you will. So uh, uh, first Saturday of the month, 8.30, it's online. Check us out at lancc.org. And uh, you can write us at uh, in, uh, DWPMOU at EmpowerLA.org. Uh, thank you very much. And we hope you, oh, neighborhood council should sign one representative. More are welcome as alternates, uh, but everyone is welcome to this meeting. Bring your friends. Thanks for keeping us on time, Tony. Okay, so again, I'm Conrad Starr, and I am the resilience liaison for my neighborhood council, Greater Wilshire, and I think I'm also the emergency preparedness liaison, and truth be told, there's quite a bit of overlap. You'll hear later about the Emergency Preparedness Alliance, but the resilience program started in 2018 when the mayor released Resilient Los Angeles, and the idea is that neighborhood councils can assist in preparing to respond to disasters and and slow moving disasters like climate change. 
Um, it can be anything from cooling centers in your area, preparing for wildfires in your area. Um, for example, a hillside area has a lot of concerns that are specific to them. Um, or it can be more general, like preparing for earthquakes. Neighborhood councils were asked to uh, draft a resilience plan. Not many have done it, but some of us are still working on it. So while there isn't any formal programming at this time for resilience liaisons, those of us who've been doing it for a while are still continuing. At my neighborhood council, we're working on a continuity of operations plan so that when the phones go out, uh, when there's no electricity, when we can't meet in our regular spaces and when Zoom doesn't work, we might still have a plan to stay in communication and provide services to our stakeholders. Um, so this is a really important role, resilience, um, because you know everything is changing and we need to be able to respond and ensure the continuity of our, uh, of our basic functions. So that's it for resilience and emergency preparedness. Let's go to John Darnell and he'll tell us about the grievance panel. John, two minutes. Thank you again, uh, John Darnell, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. Um, so yeah, so grievances. So each neighborhood council may appoint one board member or stakeholder to serve on a pool panelist uh, eligible to sit on a regional grievance panel. Where grievances are filed, three grievance liaisons are eventually chosen and meet to hear the grievance. Uh, each grievance is based on its conformity with the neighborhood council grievance policy. <clears throat> I won't read the, the section and all that, but uh, basically, uh, um, there's a the LA Administrative Code talks about that. Uh, and more information on the website is where you can read it. But the, the grievance portal allows stakeholders or board members to file grievances against the neighborhood council board, not individuals, but the board, uh, that they believe has failed to follow any of the following. So a bylaw or standing rule, a section of the Los Angeles Administrative Code, a section of the plan for the citywide system of neighborhood councils. An, an, an applicable policy of the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners, a rule or regulation promulgated by the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, any other city code executive directive rule or regulation applicable to neighborhood councils. Uh, so that can be filed. It has to be within 30 days of the incident of when that so-called happened. Uh, and one other reminder is you can't file grievances um, if you think a neighborhood council may have violated the Brown Act. Uh, that doesn't count. So in a nutshell, if you wanna think of it in terms of the grievances are, are more for um, violating like, you know, more local policy or, or the bylaws or standing rules of a neighborhood council, not, not state law, stuff like that. There's a different way to address that. And if you ever have that concern, we're happy to help you at the department. Um, but grievances are, are, are for, the, for those things. 10 and seconds. If people ever have questions, uh, please contact us, let us know. All right, thanks, John Darnell. So now we will go to Paul Jenkins to talk about how he has put his homeless liaison role to work at his neighborhood council. Paul, two minutes. Hi, everyone. I'm Paul Jenkins. I'm the public safety chair of the Hollywood Hills West Neighborhood Council. And what happened is our housing chair got fed up with being the homeless liaison. And since I was already getting a lot of issues coming across the public safety, I said I'd take it. Uh, since I did, it's been very interesting. What you do is, is you go to a loss I had, used to have, I think, quarterly meetings that were very good. And they had a lot of information that you would then bring back to your neighborhood council and speak about. Uh, there's other neighborhood councils that are very involved in homelessness in Hollywood also, and we all get together and have meetings, discuss it. Uh, so, and a lot of issues come up in Hollywood and you know what's going on with the homeless liaison. Uh, that's some of the things I've done. Now, as I got into it, I've always kind of studied it. Myself and another stakeholder as a construction manager uh, looked at parking structures, and we think the top floor parking structures would be a great location to put bridge housing. And actually, we're now pursuing that with the city and county, and it's getting a lot of traction. There's a lot of interest in using the top floors of all the county structures, potentially the city structures, potentially, and then private structures. And then we're also looking to tie that into a resiliency center. So you can take this bridge housing and once it's not needed, it can become a resiliency center for after a disaster. So that's kind of how it all came together. So that's my story. Uh, I'm passionate about homelessness now. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult topic for the city. And I think you can have more than one homeless liaison also. So if people are interested, there's a lot of work there that needs to be done in, in your neighborhood council. So that's it. Thanks so much, Paul. Wonderful. I am now going to show a quick video from a public works liaison, the only one that I know from Greater Wilshire. Just a moment. 
name's Hayden Ashworth, and I serve as the appointed public works liaison for the Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council. In 2015, the public works liaison role was created at the request of Mayor Eric Garcetti to serve as the point of contact for the Neighborhood Council system. The primary role of the public works liaison is to focus on creating a cleaner and more livable city through the Clean Streets Initiative. Other responsibilities include working with the Board of Public Works, the Bureau of Street Services, the Bureau of Street Lighting, and LA Sanitation. The Public Works Liaison serves stakeholders by connecting them to MyLA311, utilizing the smartphone app, the city's website, or the 311 call center. MyLA311 allows stakeholders to easily connect with city services. To get involved or find out more on how the Public Works Liaison role works, visit EmpowerLA.org. All right, so now we turn to the alliances. And this is gonna be harder to keep everyone on time, but we're gonna do our best. The first one is budget tribunes and Josh Nadell will tell us all about it. Josh, please go ahead, two minutes. Hi, yeah, my name is Josh Nadell. I'm one of the two co-chairs for the budget tribunes. Um, we're another budget alliance along with the budget advocates. And while they like to take a, a big top-down look from the budget and do an amazing job of looking at the whole city budget, we're, we concentrate more on helping individual departments or looking at the individual topics. So for instance, right now, we're working on um, a topic with the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, working on their budget and services. And we even have a survey out to their employees to figure out what exactly they're doing their tasks on so that we can figure out how to optimize their workflow relative to their budget so that they can get increased performance without needing to get additional funds. We're working with Bonk on a couple projects. We're engaged with the brand new youth development department uh, on another project, helping them um, try to figure out an initial budget for another consideration that isn't necessarily just coming from the CAO and the, the mayor's office. We're very excited to look into a bunch of different budget topics and to look at it really from, like I said, from the ground level, trying to figure out how each individual department um, affects you, the stakeholder, or how we can just overall improve system wide stuff. You can feel free to reach us at budgettribunes at gmail.com, and I will put that in the chat. Thank you so much. All right. So next up, uh, we have got, my goodness, I'm scrolling myself to find out. That's Doug Epperhart. I'm sorry, Doug, I just muted you. Uh, if you can tell us all about the Harbor Area Alliance well, I, of Neighborhood Councils. I just unmuted myself, so it's Great. okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. The Harbor Alliance of Neighbor Councils, I think it's the smallest alliance. There are only seven members because we are down here in the Harbor area, sort of away from everybody else. Uh, we meet on the first Wednesday. I put the uh, link to our website in the chat if anybody's interested. We've been around for a long time and obviously probably the single most important priority for us is the port of Los Angeles and everything associated with it, which includes truck traffic, pollution issues, and actually a lot of development that goes on related to the port and the people who work there or work around there. Um, our last meeting was uh, concerned almost exclusively with the proposed amendments to the Code of Conduct. We had a very in-depth session on that. Probably our next meeting will be dealing with the EBG hybrid uh, and what's going on with those uh, proposals. Uh, we are sort of lucky in that we are contained within a single neighbor uh, city council district. So we're dealing with one council member rather than multiple council members, which sort of makes things easier. One of the other initiatives that we're looking at uh, for the near future, especially following the elections and new folks coming on board to NCs, is some educational work, teaching people who are coming into the system uh, things beyond the Brown Act that are really more political in terms of being influential and uh, realizing how we do actually make government more responsive to us. 10 seconds. I'm done. Oh, 
Thank you so much, Doug Epperhart. Who is next? That would be Glenn Bailey and David Ubersax to talk about LANK. And I'm giving them an extra minute so they can uh, tell us what LANK stands for as part of their presentation. Guys, go ahead. Glenn, you want to go first or shall I? Los Angeles right. Neighborhood Council Coalition. All right, I'll go for a little bit. Um, 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 I'm Dave Ubersax. I'm with Winneka Neighborhood Council president there. Previously, I was in Greater Griffith Park, now Los Feliz Neighborhood Council. And one of the first things I did besides doing my local committee is I found out about the local meetings of the citywide uh, neighborhood council. Um, uh, it's really profound that the reach that we have, we usually have our meetings the same time, if not the same venue as the DWP committee. And I remember the first time the DWP Memo of Understanding Committee became two committees so that we could deal with advocacy. Um, we kind of do advocacy as well in terms of finding things that apply, particularly if they're citywide. Um, we'll have uh, you know, speakers, we have great access. Our president, Terrence Gomes, um, followed the footsteps of Len Schaefer um, of getting great access to city people to be able to come. We also surface issues from across the city. If we have somebody that's popping up in one area, uh, we're able to share it, bring in a large group of people, and maybe come up with a motion that we share with all the neighborhood councils who have liaisons. Uh, we standardly have a, a liaison and a backup and, uh, um, you know, one vote for neighborhood councils. And that's why we try to approach as, uh, 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 as much as possible the same sort of rigorous uh, uh, parliamentary standards to make sure that what we're doing is uh, has integrity with what we are then in terms recommending that the neighbor councils themselves consider the most powerful thing out there is advocacy directly, for example, with a community impact statement. If we come up with something that maybe starts in one neighborhood council, we talk about it a little bit more and then we share it with all the neighborhood council, that's really a profound way to have an impact. But Glenn's been doing this longer than me, so Glenn. 45 seconds, Glenn. I'll just add, I put it into chat. Uh, Lank does meet at 10 a.m. The website is in the chat, uh, www.lancc.org. The meetings are scheduled from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. because usually there's a meeting after 1 p.m. so we try to keep on schedule there. And the, you never know what the topics are. Sometimes we get elected officials, department heads, or other people working on issues of citywide interest. So thank you all very much. And I was muted. Thanks, Glenn and David. Let's go back to Josh Nadell, who's now going to talk about LA Youth Alliance. Josh, you got two minutes. Hi, I'm here again, Josh Nadell. I am the chair of the Adult Advisory Board for the LA Youth Alliance. Um, the previous alliance, I spoke about the Budget Tribunes. Uh, we had four teen board members earlier this year, and they helped us put on a great event. And then they asked, what more can they do for the community? And I told them there aren't any youth alliance. So they decided to start a youth alliance in June um, with me helping them. We already have 30 kids. We have done a lot of planning for next year. We're gonna do a big Black History Month event at the forum, and we've already secured that venue. We've secured the Galen Center to do a Women's History Month event next year. We're gonna to try to set a Guinness World Record for biggest city and county cleanup um, in April for Earth Day and a bunch of other really fun stuff. We just had some meetings with LAUSD and the Greater LA Boys and Girls Clubs and we're gonna be putting our alliance in front of them as well. And they're very excited to work with us. And our goal is just to try to give more opportunities to all the youth of our area, either in terms of leadership and how we plan these events or just merely coming to all these events and enjoying a good time, learning more about their city, um, uh, education, culture, all of those kinds of things. We plan on taking kids to museums and universities and colleges once a month, once COVID is, is uh, all sorted out. And we're just very excited. Um, you can reach out to us at layouthalliance at gmail.com. And once again, I'll put that in the chat. Thank you so much. And everyone can save the chat with those three little dots in the chat box, at least if you're from a computer. Um, we'll try and remind you at the end. Next, we have Max Kirkham to talk about the LGBTQ plus alliance. Max, you've got two minutes. 
Thank you so much, Conrad. Hi, everyone. My name is Max Kirkham. I am the, uh, my pronouns are he and him. Uh, I am the co-chair of the LGBTQ plus Alliance of Los Angeles Neighborhood Councils, previously vice president of the Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council. Um, the Alliance is the first city-backed initiative for the LGBTQ community in the history of the city of Los Angeles, and it provides an opportunity for neighborhood leaders throughout Los Angeles to connect while working to achieve a common purpose of visibility, safety, equality, racial justice, and representation for all Angelinos identifying across uh, the gender and sexuality spectrum. Uh, we have monthly general meetings and five committees that are all doing great work. Um, and some examples of things that we've done, we host panel discussions. Uh, we did the Zoom background that I, you can see in my background now as part of a Pride Month toolkit we distributed to all neighborhood councils. Um, we have put on clothing and hygiene supplies uh, drives to uh, benefit unhoused youth at the LGBT Center. Um, and then we've also been visited by uh, various city and county officials, um, Controller Ron Galprin, <clears throat> excuse me, Mayor Garcetti, Assessor Jeffrey Prang, and then most recently we've been working with uh, G General Manager Raquel Beltran of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment uh, to help develop the DEI diversity, equity, and inclusion training that is going to be uh, rolled out to all neighborhood council members uh, in the next year or two. Um, going forward, we're looking forward to celebrating LGBTQ History Month, which is uh, October. Um, please note for us, while each neighborhood council can officially appoint two liaisons to our alliance, if any other board members or any other stakeholders want to become voting members of the alliance, uh, we open the floor to new members by self-acclamation at the Ten beginning seconds. of every meeting. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll share more info in the chat or how to contact us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Max Kirkham. All right, so next up we have Commissioner Lynn Schaefer, a commissioner of the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners, and he's gonna talk for a couple minutes about the Neighborhood Council Emergency Preparedness Alliance. Lynn, please go ahead. Lynn, you might be muted. Is he with us? Uh, oh, there we go, okay. There he is, I'll start your time over. Go for it. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see people. I'm Len Schaefer. I facilitate the Neighborhood Council Emergency Preparedness Alliance. The first meeting of the Alliance was in late 2015 in response to the predicted flooding from a large El Nino event. Uh, it missed us and hit Northern California. So that was a, a, a thing that just didn't occur. But the, uh, the first emphasis um, was on what efforts the city was making to become prepared for a major event such as a large earthquake. <clears throat> We discovered that the city departments were well prepared, but the public had been left out of a lot of these plans. Uh, over the years, we've brought in speakers with expertise on uh, various emergencies and various things that we might see here in Southern California and in Los Angeles, and uh, look to them to help us uh, be educated on how to become prepared. Um, the goal was how to work with the city to involve neighborhood councils in preparing neighborhoods for various emergencies from earthquakes to hillside fires. Um, we found that uh, within the city, there was a lack of coordination. There were too many agencies. There was a lack of communication amongst those agencies. We did some um, cooperative, well, we did see some cooperation between city agencies. Uh, one of the best was the LAFD. Uh, and individual neighborhood councils. A good example of that was a simulated evacuation of an area of the Hollywood Hills that was put together by LAFD and neighborhood councils in that area. We had a start to a good partnership with the Emergency Management Department, EMT, to promote their Ryland program, but that was interrupted by uh, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic and uh, has never gotten started again with neighborhood councils. Um, unfortunately, and I say that uh, really, we've never quite been able to coordinate with the city on an ongoing basis. 20 so, seconds. How many? 20. Okay, I'll move fast. So we've been moving forward uh, on our own. The city's resilience plan tasked neighborhood councils with developing an EP plan, and that's what we're doing, and we're getting started again uh, after this pandemic. We have come to realize that our early efforts assumed everybody lived in a single family residence and could make their own preparations. But with 60% or more of the city's population being renters, this was not a sustainable model. 
We're now looking at how we can also promote preparedness amongst those who live in multifamily housing and those who live in underserved communities. Uh, while we do not normally take positions on citywide issues, we have them uh, supported things like increases in the number of CERT trainers, increases in budgets for departments like EMD and funding for emergency planning. We meet at Final 10, comment. We meet from 10 to 12 noon on Friday each month, and I'll put my contact information in the chat so that you can get a hold of us. Thank you, Saturday, Commissioner. Saturday, Len. Saturday, right? Saturday. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Schaefer. Let's go now to Ron Migdahl, who uh, recently started the Neighborhood Council Public Safety Chairpersons Alliance. Ron, tell us in two minutes what it's all about. Ron, we don't hear you yet. Okay, am I good? There you're good. Please, go ahead. First of all, Conrad, thank you for putting this together. This is, I'm sure, a titanic effort. Um, the, as you said, we are the youngest alliance. Uh, we don't have a website yet, but I will put my email in the chat. Um, I'm gonna start by reading our mission statement. It's pretty short, and I think that will give you some explanation. The Neighborhood Council Public Safety Chairpersons Alliance, uh, NCPSCA, is a citywide alliance of public safety chairpersons and other public safety leaders collaborating in order to enhance public safety in Los Angeles by unifying the efforts of public safety committees. Sharing public safety ideas and procedures can only work to benefit all of our Los Angeles stakeholders. So, uh, admittedly, there is some overlap between public safety and uh, emergency preparedness. We, we are focused a little more toward safety, law enforcement, uh, things like that. Uh, sorry, fire, law enforcement, things like that. Um, I, like most of you, I wear many hats. I'm the vice chair of my council. I'm the resilience liaison, the emergency preparedness liaison the public safety committee chairperson and the chairperson of this alliance. Um, so we've had some excellent, excellent speakers, including Armando Hogan from LAFD, uh, Captain Three, John Tom from West Bureau, uh, Jimmy Lavinson, who is our uh, senior lead officer, really, really out outstanding speakers. The last meeting uh, per the request of the members, we didn't have any speaker. It was just a sleeves up sort of sharing and, and speaking with one another. We meet the third Tuesday of every month. Um, if you shoot me an email back, I will include you in our mailing list. And put that in the chat, Ron, if you don't mind. And I need I, to move us along. Thanks so much, Ron Migdal. And let's move to Muriel Nakar. I hope I'm saying your last name right. She's going to talk about the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance in two minutes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, my name is Muriel Nakar. Um, I'm a steering board member with the NCSA. Um, so these are just a rough, um, sorry, uh, just like a quick little spiel on the NCSA. Our mission is to advance sustainability and resilience across LA through advocacy, community action, and the sharing of best practices. So far, 64 neighborhood councils have joined. Um, we have four committees so far. We have advocacy, energy, transportation, and trees. I am the, the chair for transportation. Um, we've dropped sustainability guidelines for developers. We have a green business ambassador program. We have a Green New Deal toolkit for neighborhood councils. We have resources for electric vehicles. We are launching a coal blocks program, looking for coal block leaders. Um, the program launch it starts off in January. Um, it's a block by block organization uh, organizing effort to help people create the neighborhood they want to live in and improve the environment at the same time. Um, households work on reducing their carbon footprint, conserving water, um, making their neighborhoods safer and more livable and getting prepared for emergencies or whatever they wanna work on um, for building the community that they want. And everyone is welcome to join our efforts. I'm gonna add more information in the chat, just our main, um, our website. Our big meetings are usually the second Sunday of every month. So our next one's gonna be on Sunday. We're gonna have, we're gonna, we, we plan to hold an advocacy um, training for that particular Sunday. And um, yeah, so come and get your questions about community impact statements and discuss how we could use our collective voice for change. 
And um, I'm gonna link our website to the chat and we also have a Slack workspace. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Muriel. And uh, Matt, you're gonna be after Vank because I just got a last minute submission that comes alphabetically before the W. So Valley Air Alliance of Neighborhood Councils, Glenn Bailey, tell us all about it. Uh, good morning. Uh, the Valley Alliance of Neighborhood Councils is the, was founded by Jill Banks Barad in um, uh, 18 years ago. It is the oldest and the largest of the regional alliances because there are 34 neighborhood councils in the San Fernando Valley now. So we have representation at, at uh, some point in time from each of those 34 neighborhood councils. Uh, the VANC is organized with, in addition with an executive committee of, of 12 uh, folks from different of those neighborhood councils. Uh, the Valley Alliance meets on the second Thursday of the month at 6.30 p.m., uh, currently virtually via Zoom. We have guest speakers, which include elected officials, uh, department heads, and other folks uh, presenting information of interest from uh, two neighborhood councils. We frequently have uh, the general manager of the department neighborhood empowerment or somebody else from the department to give updates from Dunn. Um, and we deal with issues, including council files. And I have put into chat the uh, fact that the VANC is hosted on the LANC uh, NC Alliance's webpage. As far as our meeting notices, the Zoom link, which is the same for each month, the agendas are posted there once they're available, and also a link to the recordings of our previous meetings since we went virtual in July of 2020. So you can, you can see the recordings of any meetings for the past year and three months, and we'll continue doing that for as long as we're virtual. Um, 10 seconds. Okay, thank you. Oh, we, and I do wanna thank those of you from the Valley uh, who are attending this session, because I know you, you do uh, show up at the bank meeting. So we wanna make sure all of the 34 neighborhood councils are represented. Thank you very much. Thanks, Glenn, and thanks for mentioning the EmpowerLA.org slash alliances page, because that shows that there are some additional alliances that didn't make it to today's session, but you can find out about them there and how to contact them. Next, let's go to, uh, I'm sorry, I just lost yours, Matt. It is the Westside Regional Alliance of Councils. Matt, take it away. Good morning. I'm the president of the Delaware Neighborhood Council and also the chair of the Westside Regional Alliance of Councils. At RAC, we have 14 member councils. We represent approximately 500,000 stakeholders from uh, everywhere from west of the La Cienega to the uh, Pacific Ocean. We go from the Palisades down to Westchester. Uh, we do, as John noted at the beginning, have both community councils and member councils. I, I believe we're the only ones to do that. And that just comes out of trying to be inclusive of our whole geographic area. Uh, we meet the third Monday of every month. Our website is westsidecouncils.com, and on there you can find our agendas, uh, our motions, and, uh, and some more information about all of our member councils. Uh, over the past year, since I've taken over as chair, we've refocused our mission to be twofold. The first one is to be carrying motions. Uh, the RAC board doesn't vote to, uh, to approve motions. We vote to send it out to member councils. And when we get to eight of our councils to approve, the action becomes official. By not being uh, you know, a Brown Act and not being an official neighborhood council, we have the advantage that we can then take those motions and reach out to county and state officials that neighborhood councils may not technically be able to go directly to and lobby for those motions in that sense. Um, we also have uh, prioritized guests and that's been really important to us. And on a monthly basis, we've been trying to bring in uh, uh, who, whoever we can from the mayor to our Congress folks, to county supervisors, to the uh, county health director. We've had a really good track record of engaging um, our elected officials and having them come and speak to our board members. Um, 15 seconds. We also have a number of active committees in homelessness uh, land use and mobility and transportation. And again, our website's westsidecouncils.com, third Monday of every month. Look forward to seeing everyone there. Thank you, Matt Worthinger. So this again is Conrad Starr. I'll just tell you briefly about the Congress of Neighborhoods Planning Committee. Uh, we meet after the LANC meeting, uh, which is every first Saturday at 1.30 p.m., if I've got that right. Um, 
Traditionally, we met in person. Lately, we've been meeting on Zoom. And we have a number of opportunities. Uh, obviously, we have to divide the labor to pull off an event like this. So there's a programming subcommittee. I co-chair that with Tony Wilkinson, who you heard from today. Um, we have production. We have uh, outreach, two different kinds of outreach. Um, as well as a budget and finance subcommittee. So everyone who participates, uh, well, we welcome people from all over the city. Um, and if you do participate, we hope that you'll join one of those subcommittees so that we can really get all the work done. Um, I, obviously, I was just winging that. I hope I, I shared enough. Um, and go ahead and send a message to uh, uh, programming at neighborhoodcongress.la and I'll forward it to the right person if you're interested in joining. I think there's a link in the program as well. So I think we now have time for questions. Um, so everyone, if you can please raise your hand. I see that uh, one of our panelists has a question. And so while, uh, while we're seeing if there are any questions from the audience, uh, we'll see what Tony has to add to what I just mentioned. Well, I want to point out that the uh, the Alliances are a great way to involve communities in what we do. Uh, neighborhood councils aren't 15 or 20 people who gather together in a boutique debating society. We've got a charter responsibility to involve more people in government. And certainly all of the alliances and particularly the topic alliances and the liaisons give people who are not on boards great opportunities to participate in city government, to come back and talk to the board about what we've done. So I hope that, that as part of our community broad outreach to get more people involved than just board members, we emphasize alliances, whether it's sustainability, obviously VWP, whatever, just a fertile field for this. And so please add some more people. And remember, you can always have alternates. Thank you. And I'd like to invite other panelists to give their comments. Um, Paul Jenkins, and then I want to mention something about purposeful aging. Paul, what are your thoughts? Hi, just a question for John. Uh, how many liaisons can you have, like let's say from the homeless or any of them? John Darnell? I think there's about 10. Let me see here. Well, if you go to- can, can we have several homeless liaisons, several public safety? Several oh yeah, so as far as the amount you can have on your uh, board, mo for most of the liaison positions, there's no limit. Uh, for data, it's up to three. I believe Glenn had uh, chatted film as one, and I think grievances is uh, one, but all the rest is basically, uh, there's no limit. Uh, and then what Jack had mentioned earlier, the budget advocates, remember the budget rep is a representative from your neighborhood council. The limit on that is two, um, but most of them though, there's no limit. So yeah, definitely like like homelessness, for example, or emergency preparedness, which are some of the most you know active. Um, yeah, you could potentially, I guess once you could have 10 and they don't have to be board members, you know, they can be stakeholders. So that's probably one of the more underutilized aspects of it where you could have non-board members just flood it and really help out. You know, each person could take a chunk of work and come to the board meetings and help. Let's go to Voss in the audience, and then I will tell you about purposeful aging a little more. Please go ahead. Uh, Voss, did you have a question? Okay, I'll tell you about purposeful aging. Uh, this I was in another neighborhood council meeting, and uh, I thought this was so elegantly stated. Um, the chair said, this is an initiative the city and county and AARP use to prepare for demographic shifts. So it involves engagement with our elderly community and with the nonprofits and community resources that are available to them, making sure that they have access to civic participation, to employment, to emergency preparedness, health and transportation. And he noted there's a lot of overlap with transit and health and disability. So that, that was, I thought, a very, very great answer. Um, Voss, are you able to unmute yourself? It looks like you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. Um, Glenn Bailey. I just wanted to chime in with regards to one of the other uh, uh, neighbor council alliance, um, sorry, um, liaison programs that was established through the mayor's office and the department, and that is animal services. Um, because there are uh, throughout the neighbor council system, a lot of folks who uh, care about animals and the animal issues. And I, I'm only making a point of this is that they've had several meetings in the past, but now that there's a new general manager of the department, 
it might be good for neighborhood councils to um, reach out and uh, contact the department and say, hey, we've got folks who are interested in this. Can you restart up the uh, liaison meetings for animal services? Thank you. And before we go to Jack Humphreyville again, just want to remind everyone, we'll be closing this room in four minutes, and then it's time for you to move on to the main room. So you'll go to neighborhoodcongress.la to find the link for the opening session. Jack, please go ahead. Yeah, I, this is a suggestion for, uh, for Dunn. I think it would be very helpful on the Dunn website and on, any, on, a, <coughs> and on each of the neighborhood councils that they would identify who the, who the various liaisons are. Who's the budget advocate? Who's the DWP? Who's animal services? Who's the who's the Tribune? You know, who's the sustainability uh, person? And that way, I think it would make it, it would it would just be helpful to have that in place so that uh, people know who the hell who the hell is representing them. Thanks very much, Jack. I actually went to uh, the. Um... Internet Archive Wayback Machine to find old lists of liaisons to try and get people into this session. Those lists were very helpful. I hope they come back. So I'm putting into the chat the link for the main session, which starts at nine, but we still have a couple of minutes. Josh Nadell, please go ahead. Yeah, I just want to follow up on what Jack just said. I think that that's a wonderful idea. And I think that if all the NCs were posting those lists, any of these alliances that don't have membership from those NCs, once they see that there's a blank spot on their list of like who they could be, have a representative for, you know, be it um, a liaison, an alliance or something, lots of people don't like seeing blank spots if they have them there. So maybe that can get more membership in all these alliances and all these liaison jobs more filled up as well. So it's a wonderful idea. I, I hope maybe John Darnell can give us a hand at working on that. Maybe John can do it tomorrow and we'll be all set on Monday. <laughs> John, you've got your marching orders. Um, well, uh, I didn't what hear I a hope... second to the motion, so sorry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what I hope everyone has taken away is that um, all of these roles take some self-initiative. Um, we may not have the traditional support from the city and the department with all the, the COVID restrictions and budget constraints. Um, and yet you hear about liaisons who are really making the job their own. And uh, with the, with the uh, support of the neighborhood council, they feel confident to go to city departments, say, I am my neighborhood council's liaison. And um, I wish to have a discussion with you about this, or I'd like you to come and speak to a committee or address our general board. Um, this will not be spoon fed to you. So whether or not you find your way onto a list that's on a website someday, you're gonna to have to do the work or it's just gonna be you know, paperwork essentially and, and nobody needs more paperwork. Um, is there a final question or comment that anyone would like to make? Um, and I, I will also, let's go to Paul Jenkins and then we'll turn it back to John Darnell and then we will close the room. Hi, John, another question for you. The process, if someone was to be a liaison, is the president of the neighborhood council just approves it or can you confirm real quick what the process is? Yes, uh, unless your bylaws are standing rules or policies and procedures, whatever you have say otherwise, then yes, the chair or president of the neighborhood council can just appoint the person um, between board meetings, for example, like say it's not at a board meeting and someone emails them, they can surely just appoint them. Uh, however, at the next board meeting, whether it be a special or regular, we highly advise that that chair or president, um, probably at the next regular meeting, because it will be on the agenda as far as reports and liaisons, but that that chair or president announced that they appointed somebody, so it's recorded in the minutes. Uh, as part of the report uh, for liais all liaisons at next regular board. And can a liaison then have their own meeting, or what is their ability if they're not a board member? 10 seconds, John, then we got to close well, it down. Uh, they can find a committee that the neighborhood council might have that they can they can attend or they can join, uh, create an ad hoc committee for a project or a permanent standing committee, maybe if there's not one. You know, not all, for example, not all neighborhood councils even have land use committees, right? So um, you might be surprised that there might not even be a thing there. But, um, so all yeah, right, John. Um, <clears throat> Let's 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 uh, let let everyone follow up directly if they have more questions. Please, everyone, save the chat. If you are on a computer, open the chat box. Look for those three little dots at the bottom and click Save Chat. It'll save to your computer. Um, and feel free to reach out to programming at 
neighborhoodcongress.la and I'll try and get your question through to the right person. So uh, everyone, we'll see you in the main session. John, I'll leave it to you to close the meeting out.